Hi! Welcome to an introduction to Apache Kafka. In this video, we're going to discuss what Kafka is, who uses it, how it works, and how to start using it with Python. Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform written in Java and developed as a messaging system for LinkedIn in 2010. We'll talk about what that means as we go. Kafka is used to publish streams of records, subscribe to streams of records, store fault-tolerant, durable records of streams, and process streams of records as they occur. So what does that really mean? Kafka moves information between computers or servers in a reliable way that ensures that the platform is rarely offline and never loses data in the process. This data can also be saved to maintain a record of what has been transmitted. Kafka is typically used in the industry to provide real-time streaming solutions, reliable data pipelines, or to implement applications that react to streams of data. Think about something like a messaging app. You might need to transfer a message between two devices, but you also might want to have a history of that stream. Kafka is used by some of the largest tech companies in the world in different ways. LinkedIn actually originally created it to service their timeline and feed pipeline, but it has grown as an open source project to include many other features used by many other groups. Since we just discussed the different capabilities and use cases of Kafka, let's take a look at how one of these organizations uses Kafka. For example, LinkedIn, the creator of Kafka, uses Kafka to handle 1.4 trillion messages per day across 1400 brokers. They describe the information that's passed across Kafka as mission critical. As we just discussed, one of the key points of Kafka is that it is highly redundant. Like many of the companies listed in this slide, LinkedIn is primarily a web software and data company. The majority of their revenue comes from data they generate from their web platform. When you look at it like this, it becomes pretty obvious why companies would want to store such important information in a redundant way, which is what they use Kafka for. Think about building your own application. What information would you want to safely store and transmit between two or more devices? For example, if you're building a dating app, you might want to make sure the messages between two people actually get to each other and are stored in a safe way. So now that you know what Kafka is, let's discuss a little bit about what makes it run. Kafka has five main components that we're going to need to know if we're going to discuss how Kafka works. These are topics, partitions, consumers, producers, and clusters. Let's start out with the topic. Topics are Kafka's abstraction for a named stream of records divided into partitions which can have multiple subscribers. Let's think about if Kafka was being used in something like a radio app. The topic might be your university's news, where the host is writing to the topic and many people are receiving that stream of data from the same topic. Like we just mentioned, topics can contain one or more partitions. A partition allows a large stream of data to be split into smaller segments. This way, partitions of a topic can be distributed or even cloned for redundancy across other systems or even geographical areas, but still remain a part of the same topic. Returning to our radio show example, the whole radio show might be the topic, but each episode could be the partition, or each minute, or each second, depending on how high quality and how large the actual files are. We've talked about how we're going to store data, but how does it get there? That's the job of the producer. Producers are responsible for producing data and publishing it to a topic. If the data that they are producing needs to be partitioned, producers are also the ones responsible for controlling how the data is partitioned in a topic. In our radio show example, the internet radio host would be the producer. The host would not only be responsible for getting the information to the topic, but they would also be responsible for how it's divided, so the producer would also decide if each episode would be a partition, or each minute, or each day, things like that. All of that data is being used by something, and that's where our consumers come in. 
Consumers subscribe to a topic and read data from them as the information becomes available. Let's go back to our radio show example. The people tuning in to the show are the consumers. So the last important thing we need to know about before we can really discuss Kafka is going to be clusters. As we mentioned earlier, Kafka is redundant and extremely durable. Kafka is able to achieve this by distributing load across many servers or even many data centers. Each of these groups of servers is going to be referred to as a Kafka cluster. If a server fails, the remaining systems of a cluster can still uphold the entire system. Now that we understand these five main components of Kafka, let's take a look at how they all work together to form Kafka as a whole. The key concept of Kafka to understand is that producers write to a topic and consumers will read from that topic. Topics are stored within Kafka clusters. These topics are composed of partitions, which are distributed across the cluster. When producers write to partitions within a topic, they do so based on a predetermined pattern. This is called a balancing pattern. The pattern could be something like first in first out, a load balancer to evenly distribute load across the servers, or a proprietary or private algorithm that determines where to send data based on the programmer's needs. This pattern is used to determine how to divide data across the topic's partitions. Now let's take a closer look at consumers. When data is written to a partition, a consumer or multiple consumers receives the data from those partitions. Let's take a closer look at how the consumers receive that data. Many consumers may be grouped together into a named consumer group. For simplicity, we'll use two groups, one with two consumers and another with four consumers. Consumer groups are composed of consumer instances, each of which could be on one server or spread across many servers. Load within a group is spread throughout the instances. In this example, both groups are subscribed to the same partitions, so both consumer groups are really receiving the same information. The key difference is that they're distributing that information differently and evenly throughout the consumer instances. For example, the group on the left is distributing partitions 0 and 1 to consumer instance 1 and 3, and then 2 and 3 to 2 and 4. However, the right consumer group only has two consumer instances. So, consumer instance 5 is taking partition 0 and 1, and consumer instance 6 is taking partition 2 and 3. This keeps the process fast and ensures load is being distributed across the group's consumer instances. Now that we've taken a look at producers and consumers, let's focus on the Kafka cluster itself. This is where we'll find Kafka's most notable abilities. Clusters are composed of between one and infinitely many servers running Kafka instances. Let's look at a cluster of two instances for simplicity's sake. Let's recall from before that a topic is stored within a cluster. Partitions of a topic are distributed across the Kafka instances. This distributes the load of publish and consume requests across the instances or servers. Instances are the leader of the partition whose interactions they handle. Partition data is copied across a set number of instances for fault tolerance. Instances may be the leader of some partitions and the followers of others. In this graphic, the Kafka instance on the left is the leader of partition 0 and partition 2. That is then being copied to the right Kafka instance, which is the follower of 0 and 2. The absolute opposite can be said of the group on the right. If a leader goes offline, a redundant copy is already in zero or more instances. 
A follower instance will become the leader of the partition in a way that balances the load so that the producer and consumer requests are never unanswered. In this graphic, the leader of partitions 0 and 2 has gone offline. However, there was already a copy in the right instance. Now, the right instance is the leader of all of the partitions in this topic. Just like how Kafka instances can be placed in clusters, Kafka clusters may be a part of replicated cluster groups across data centers or geographic regions. Geo-replication boosts speeds while accessing Kafka from different geographic regions, but also provides failure redundancy. For example, if the data center in Antarctica sinks into the ocean, the other data centers can handle the responsibilities of the lost data center, redistributing load so that no data or requests can be lost. Looking at the graphic, notice that all of the connections that were previously maintained by the Antarctic data center are still intact with the other data centers. There's still a copy in the other data centers and there are still connections between them. At this point, you should be fairly comfortable with the different topics of Kafka, how they work, and who uses Kafka. Let's take a look at how to make a very basic Kafka setup. We'll do this in Python since it's such a popular language and it's very verbose. However, Kafka is written and optimized for use with Java. To start out, go to the Kafka download website and check on the current version. As I'm recording this video, the current version is 2.1.0. Download the binaries for the current version either in your browser or in the terminal if you're on a server machine. In this example, we'll use wgit or webgit to download the tarball. On a Unix machine, you'll be able to unpack this tar package using the flags xvf. However, if you are not on a Unix machine, you may need to download third-party software to unpack a tar image. Next, let's navigate into the unpack directory. This directory will contain everything we need to run Apache. Apache Kafka comes with Apache Zookeeper. We'll use this script to start Zookeeper with default properties. Next, we'll use another script to start Kafka itself. By running the following script, Kafka will begin with default properties. We'll now have a very basic Apache Kafka cluster of one instance. Since we're using Python, I'm assuming you already have Python 3 installed. There are a few options of Python libraries we can use to interact with our Kafka cluster. Kafka Python is a great open source version. PyKafka is known for having the most Pythonic API. And Confluent Python Kafka was created by the inventor of Kafka itself. In the interest of supporting the open source community, this video will use Kafka Python. Use pip to install the library. From the Kafka server, let's create a topic for our own Python clients to use. This command will create a topic called test, which has only a single partition and is only replicated on our own single instance. It will only run on the default Zookeeper port 2181. Let's create a producer file in Python. This producer is targeted at our locally hosted Kafka cluster with the default port. This will need to be changed if you decide to actually host your Kafka cluster. This code segment will create a producer called p and then send a binary message of hello world to the test topic. Next, we'll set up our Python consumer. This consumer will listen on the topic test for any new messages and then write them to the standard output. Now, let's go ahead and run the consumer we just made. The consumer will run waiting to receive messages. Then, run the producer in a separate window. Once the producer is run, the consumer will receive the message and print it to standard output. 
we have now successfully created a very basic messaging system with Apache Kafka. Congratulations! That wraps up our intro on Apache Kafka's basics. If you'd like to do a little bit more of your own research on Apache Kafka, here are all of the articles that I used as references uh, during the creation of this video. The Apache Software Foundation has a lot of great articles which I highly recommend. Um, they also provided several of the black and white images throughout this video. However, all of the other images were either stock photos or made by myself. But nevertheless, thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day.